Hello everyone, it's Dr. Ryan coming to you from my office with another step one question review. Today we've got a very tricky MBME question sent to me by a student, so let's jump right in. So the question says a healthy 25 year old man participates in a study of muscle function. The electrophysiologic observations made on a muscle biopsy specimen are shown. Via iontophoresis, one micromolar of acetylcholine was applied to the muscle surface extracellular calcium concentration was decreased to prevent end plate potentials from acting as a super threshold for muscle action potentials. They show us some data. The EPP amplitude is 10. The MEPP amplitude is 1. The response to acetylcholine is 1 millivolt. Then they say, based on these findings, which of the following electrophysiologic characteristics is expected in a muscle biopsy specimen from a patient with acute botulism? And we've got a table with a bunch of different EPP, MEPPs, and acetylcholine results. Okay, let me start by telling you that I think this is a really bad question. This question is testing details of the electrophysiology of how muscle cells depolarize that are far beyond what I think most medical schools teach and what I think medical students need to know for step one. So if you were totally lost on this question, don't feel bad, that's normal. And in fact, if you want to skip this question and never think about it again, I also think that's okay. I think the chance that any of the concepts in this question come up on your step exam are less than 1%. Having said all that, let's look at the question, and I'm going to show you how I came up with the answer, even though I didn't understand the question myself, and then I'll explain to you everything the question is asking about. So let's start by looking at the question. They tell you that a healthy man participates in a study of muscle function. Okay, fine. And they make some observations on a muscle biopsy specimen. Then they tell you that they use iontophoresis to apply acetylcholine to the muscle surface. And then they have this super confusing sentence that says extracellular calcium concentration was decreased to prevent end plate potentials from acting as a super threshold for muscle action potentials. My God. Okay, but setting all that aside and setting the confusing wording of the question aside, we have some data here for the healthy man. This is his EPP amplitude, and they tell you that EPP is the end plate potential. This is his MEPP amplitude. They tell you that's one millivolt. And this is the response of his normal, healthy muscle tissue to acetylcholine, one millivolt. Then they ask you, what findings would you expect in someone who has acute botulism? All right, so when I read this question, I don't really know what end plate potentials are. I can probably figure it out by thinking about it. I've heard of end plates before. They're the part of a muscle cell that depolarizes when a neuron releases acetylcholine but I'm not really sure what MEPPs are, and basically this whole question was massively confusing to me. However, I do know one thing that I was able to use to come up with the correct answer, and that is I know what happens in botulism. So imagine that we have a neuron here, and then we have a synapse, and we've got a muscle cell over here on the other side, and there's a region of the muscle cell called the end plate, which is what initially depolarizes. So the way that this muscle cell depolarizes normally is acetylcholine is released by the neuron and it goes over here and depolarizes the muscle cell. And if you know anything about botulism from studying for step one, you know that botulism inhibits the release of acetylcholine. So only knowing that I was able to come up with the right answer. Let me tell you how I did that. So they tell you that via iontophoresis, and you don't need to know what that is, but via that process, they applied acetylcholine to the muscle surface. And this is the result they got in the healthy man. Well, what's going to happen when you apply acetylcholine to the muscle surface of a patient with botulism? It should be the same thing because botulism involves the neuron before the muscle cell, not the muscle cell itself. So just by understanding this one sentence here, which was pretty much all I understood, I reasoned that the response to acetylcholine of one millivolts should be the same in a person who has botulism. And so when I look at the answer choices, that allowed me to eliminate A, C, and D. So now I'm down to two answer choices. The difference in those two answer choices is the EPP. In answer choice B, the EPP goes down. In answer choice E, the EPP goes up. Well, EPP represents the voltage when the muscle cell depolarizes. And I surmise that there was no way that was going to go up because a person has botulism. I mean, why would botulism make more voltage occur in a muscle biopsy cell. More likely it was gonna go down and that's what B said. So I guess that B would be right and that is the correct answer. And I'm telling you that so you can see that when you're faced with these questions where you're totally lost, you're not totally lost. Just think of the things that you know. If you know how botulism works, then maybe you can cross out a couple of answers and get it down to just one or two and reason it out. Okay, so now that I told you all that, I'm gonna explain the entire question to you. And in order to do that, I had to reach out for help. 
I needed help to understand end plate potentials and miniature end plate potentials and where was I gonna get that? Well, what I did was I went to PubMed and I did a search for end plate potentials. I figured I could find some research articles on end plate potentials and sure enough, I found an article shown right here which was published within the last year and I clicked on that article like I'm doing here and I expanded the author affiliations and lo and behold, there is one of the authors who lists his email address and he is found in China. So I cut and pasted his email and I wrote him a message and I sent him the question and asked if he could help me answer it. And lucky me, he wrote me back. And in fact, he wrote me a really nice letter and he explained everything going on in the question and how to come up with the right answer B. So special thanks to Dr. Jia Zhang Wang from China who was able to help me answer this question so I can share the answer with all of you. Okay, so let's go back to the question. So first of all, this really confusing sentence about extracellular calcium concentration, this is totally irrelevant to answering this question. They're just telling you that the researchers reduced the extracellular calcium concentration so the muscle cells they were studying couldn't contract, but it has no bearing on the correct answer. Okay, now let's talk about the EPP. So remember we talked about how there's a neuron that is connected to a skeletal muscle cell. So the EPP is the voltage generated in the muscle cell when that neuron releases acetylcholine normally. So in the normal healthy subject, that was 10 millivolts. And then as we suspected earlier, that number falls down to one in a patient with botulism. And that's because botulism inhibits the ability for acetylcholine to be released. And therefore there's a much smaller end plate potential generated when the neuron tries to depolarize the muscle cell. MEPPs are miniature end plate potentials and they are spontaneous depolarizations of muscle cells. They're not affected by botulism. So that number in the correct answer is the same as in the healthy person. And then finally, just like we talked about before, the response of the muscle tissue to acetylcholine, which was one millivolt in the normal person, is also gonna be one millivolt in the person with botulism. And that's because botulism affects the neuron, but it doesn't affect the muscle cell itself. So basically, thanks to my communication with our friend from China, I was able to basically confirm that the things I was guessing at when I answered this question were correct. So what are the takeaways from this question? The first one is that some questions are really, really bad and it's not you, it's the question itself, it's poorly written. But the second takeaway from this is don't be afraid to guess. If you're completely lost in a question, just think of the things you do know and see if you can eliminate answers because you may be able to solve the question just with the little pieces you know, even if you're confused by some of the language in the question overall. And that concludes today's video of a step one question review.